welcome to this edition of the High Strangeness Factor on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Steve Ward. With me tonight is my co-host, producer, co-creator of the High Strangeness Factor, Andy Mercer. Andy, welcome back to the show. Hello, Steve. It's good to be back on, actually, from recording as well as just being in the background like I normally am. I think this is quite possibly the first time we've done a show when it's just the two of us. I really it, think it's just the first time. Yeah, it time. could be because we've uh, when we've done a show uh, with, uh, you know, interviewing you or talking about some of your uh, ideas. I think we've always had a co-host. So yeah. this is going to be a little different and it's going to be very different because we're going to be talking about something called the Great Shaver Mystery, sometimes referred to as the Great Shaver Hoax. But first, mm-hmm. I want to draw people's attention to uh, you helped me out uh, last uh, the last show. Uh, I was pretty busy and wasn't able to get a show together. And you got uh, you, you took out one of your golden oldies from uh, mm-hmm. a, a previous podcast you had done on voodoo. Yes. And uh, I want to direct people to it if you haven't listened to it. But give us kind of an idea of what when you did the show, what your approach was and what people can expect to hear. Well, first and foremost, I used to have my own uh, podcast show on this network a few years back called Radio Hermetica, where I used to talk about mainly esoteric, occult, magic, ritual type subjects. Um, I ran for about a dozen or so shows, but I found I just didn't really have enough time to devote it properly to um, making a decent show every sort of few weeks. So I kind of gave up on the idea and sort of let it sit. The old shows are sort of somewhere floating around on the network, but occasionally when you're not around, I have to dig out one of the old shows and rerun it. The Voodoo Show was actually with a good friend of mine, Richard Ward, who we still don't think is any relation to you, but he's saying he's Ward. Um, he is very much uh, a fountain of knowledge of this particular topic. It's something he's been fascinated by for absolute years. So you're listening to somebody who really knows his stuff. He's um, a, a serious um, researcher into voodoo, all aspects of voodoo. He's actually got his own book coming out with a publisher called Scarlet Imprint, which should probably be early next year now, which is about his particular area of interest of Haitian voodoo. But we talked about the various elements and aspects and tried to dispel a few myths. I think the, the biggest single myth that people have about voodoo is the term voodoo dolls, little dolls you see with pins oh, put sure. into them. They are not real at all. They do not have formed part of um, voodoo culture at all. They are a Western European invention that was actually what are called poppets. These are little um, dolls again, but they're in from Western witchcraft, which are used for the same way, sticking pins in the to sort of cause harm. But they were transported, if you like, over to the, the world of voodoo in the Caribbean by early early sort of uh, Christian pilgrims who were trying to make out that voodoo was, of course, an evil practice because they were Christians in order to give that impression. So they took across a witchcraft idea from here and transported it over there to make it sort of make out as if it was their practice. Which of course so, so voodoo dolls are almost a Hollywood invention. Yeah, that kind of thing. They're deliberately created to um, create a false impression of what voodoo was actually about. Voodoo is a religion as well as being a sort of magical practice. It has its uh, basis in African culture and African mythology. So it, it's a recognized religion as well. And that's really the kind of thing we talked about. But um <clears throat> So dispelling a few of the myths about things like the idea of zombies you might have seen in films, that the film zombie and the idea of zombie in voodoo is something, something quite different. There are different forms of zombies, if you like, including a more of a spiritual zombie, which you're kind of spiritually enslaved to another force. So it's not like you're digging the bodies from the ground and bringing them back to life. I mean, there are elements of that in there in some areas, but what you've seen in Hollywood and the movies and things like The Walking Dead, I mean, that's nothing to do with um, voodoo whatsoever. So we, we try to kind of cover those sort of areas. I mean, I've, I've got a few of these old shows floating about. Unfortunately, I have to admit, the audio quality of some of them isn't as good as it should be. It was an older mic system I was using back in those days. And this one is quite interesting. You listen to this particular show on headphones, it's like you're sitting in the middle of a conversation because I come out one speaker and my friend Richard comes out the other speaker. <laughs> so it's almost like sitting at a table listening to a conversation going on. It's quite funny, but it's just the way the microphone works. But I've got a few of them. If we ever need them again, I can sort of dig out. That was um, one of the most popular ones I did. So I thought it was nice to, to give it another airing. I remember as a kid, uh, I can't even remember who was in it. It's an old black and white film called I Walked with a Zombie. 
and I don't know if that had any roots in any of the uh, the actual religion or not. But uh, I remember being a bit creeped out by it. It was uh, wasn't your conventional, uh, you know, a, a gruesome body rising from the grave thing. But uh, mm-hmm. it's pretty hazy in my memory. The other other thing that comes to mind is uh, one of my favorite authors was uh, Abraham Merritt. He wrote, uh, wow. he kind of inspired uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know, the big, uh, the yeah. lost race kind of novels. But he wrote a, 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 he wrote some great ones like The Moon Pool and The uh, Dwellers in the Mirage and so forth. But he wrote one that was a real departure called Burn Witch Burn. And oh. it was even made into a film with one of the Barrymores. And it was, a, it was sort of, uh, the, uh, the, the woman was, uh, I, I don't know exactly what she did. She shrunk people down and, and, and made uh-huh. them into dolls or, and could control them somehow. Yeah, the, the, the novel was very creepy and pretty good. The, the, the film is kind of old and uh, it had, uh, oh, come on, the, uh, the first Jane in it uh, that stood, uh, that, that played opposite Johnny Weismiller. Oh, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, who, everybody knows who I mean, but I just, her name isn't coming. But anyway, it's just one of those. I finally saw the film, but uh uh, if anybody uh, wants to uh, read a great, uh, I, I think a fun author that, again, mostly wrote lost race novels, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the kind mm-hmm. of uh, like Tarzan was always uh, finding another lost city or lost race in Africa. And, of course, Africa couldn't be that big to, to house all those uh, lost cities. But uh, yes. Abraham Merritt, <laughs> uh, my, my, I think my, my favorite is The Moon Pool and uh-huh. uh, pretty good stuff. But anyway, uh Today, <laughs> today, we're going to talk about the Shaver mystery, and mm-hmm. uh, just to, just to start out, what uh, what do you know of anything about the Shaver mystery? Well, until the, um, this morning, probably pretty much zero. <laughs> okay. I knew a shaver. For me, a shaver thing you used to you cut your, the, your hairs off your face with. That was the only shaver <laughs> I knew about. But then um, after a little bit of research this afternoon and come across them, what I would say is a very interesting character to say the least. Certainly, the um, the way in which he presented his uh, stories is particularly fascinating. The um, old Amazing Stories magazine, which um, ah yes, is very popular and almost legendary in its um its exposition of various uh, fictional writers but of course as i'm sure we're going to be talking about he didn't see his stuff as being just fiction did he well no i uh, and uh it was uh it brings up another character it was richard sharp shaver of course is the the gentleman that claimed uh these strange experiences and, and he even claimed he was actually held prisoner in the caves beneath the earth by a race of creatures called the darrow uh but the other principal character is ray palmer and he of course was the editor of amazing mm-hmm. stories i actually have uh most of the amazing stories that were printed during that time period in the mid 40s when uh when palmer was was publishing these stories uh, uh supposedly they he took uh shaver's reality his true true stories and then fictionalized them but we'll get into that in a moment um to the uh a major event that kind of starts this whole thing off is uh uh, the reason I want to talk about it is because, uh, ironically, it occurred only about six miles south of where I was born. Oh, wow. I was I, I was born in a uh, uh, one of these when they used to have these small community general hospitals. Uh, Royal Oak, Michigan, is just a few miles north of Detroit, and uh, uh, if you you go a little bit further south, uh, you'll hit uh, Eight Mile Road which is the infamous eight mile road, uh, Eminem and did a movie and oh, had the, yeah. Yeah, all yeah. that. But, uh, I actually grew up just South of nine miles. So I don't, I don't think it was close enough to have any real street cred. I, I definitely am not hip. So, <laughs> you know, I've lost that lost out on that. But if you go a little further, that's the, that's the borderline of Detroit. If you go a little further South, you hit a captive suburb called Highland Park. And back in the early 1930s, it was Briggs Auto Body that a man named Richard Shaver was working at. And uh, Briggs Auto Body eventually became, I believe, the first Ford plant. Well, whenever Shaver would key up his welder, he was a spot welder, he would start to hear voices. And they, they weren't talking to him. It was like he was tuned into a conversation. And they were saying things like, uh, 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 the, talking about stopping automobiles, uh, stopping mm. planes in flight, causing all kinds of havoc. He said he could hear people screaming because they were being tortured by some by these. Later on, that he found out that these creatures were called Darrow. Uh, 
And uh, he also heard something about uh, somebody talking about uh, piloting a spaceship in real time. So, uh, uh, so what now during this time period, this is during the depression. Uh, he had, uh, the Shavers had, uh, uh, came out of Pennsylvania. They came to Detroit because of the, uh, you know, the, the auto plants and so forth. And uh, the problem with, with Shaver was that he still kept hearing these voices. And uh, he was married to a lady named Sophie Gervich, and they had a, a young child named Evelyn. And so uh, uh, following this one thread, Shaver gets uh, uh, Ben Gervich is very upset that his uh, son, he didn't like the, wasn't uh, 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 for the marriage anyway. And he met Sophie, by the way, this is kind of important, at the Wicker School of Art. This is a uh, uh, something that Shaver found that he was really good at. He was, uh, uh, the art thing really worked for him, but he was so poor, he couldn't even afford, you know, the materials and so forth. But uh, what happened was, Ben Gurbich got him put in a mental institution. And this was uh, in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And this particular institution was, uh, it, it was a state of the art at the time. He was able to go home on weekends. So it wasn't that horrific of a, a situation, but unfortunately tragedy struck. His wife, Sophie was electrocuted accidentally with a heater in the bathroom in the, by, by the bathtub. And so, and she had been his guardian. And so she's gone. Ben Gurbich decides, OK, he's not he's not going to uh, his daughter will never know him and he's going to make sure he's permanently stuck in a mental institution. Mm -hmm. But but Shaver takes off. He escapes and he sleeps all over the the eastern U.S. for a while. And but he still thinks he's being followed by these voices and he thinks that they're they're actually worse in some of these city areas. And so. Uh, uh, Let's see. I think uh, I think I'll yeah you know, continue with Shaver a little bit. Then we can get in. Well, let's 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 stop that for a minute. Uh, Ray Palmer is a very interesting character. He was born in 1910, and uh, in uh, Wisconsin, and uh, he had he was beset by all kinds of tragedies. He was run over by a truck when he was in second grade. Uh, mm -hmm. He was in great pain. His spine was fractured. His father was a drunk and a bastard, and he didn't get him proper medical care. Uh, Shaver went through several years of uh, very little schooling. Uh, he contracted TB, uh, but he was a survivor. There was several times when they pronounced him, uh, you know, he's going to die in just a matter of days or months or whatever. But he survived all that, and uh, he, uh, he actually uh, got to a point, there was a, a surgeon that uh, it was experimental that actually uh, partially repaired his spine at one point, but then later on he contracted. Uh, I think he was uh, uh, in his twenties. He contracted TB again, and it, it hurt his uh, situation. His spine started to separate again. But he actually used uh, what we would call today positive thinking and created visualization. And they had given him up for dead. But they finally he didn't die. So they took x-rays again and found that some of the cartilage had actually formed to fuse the spine together again. Now, Ooh. still, he was he was kind of a he was very short. I mean, he was in pain a lot and he wasn't completely cured by any means. But for some, you know, somehow he survived. And then uh, uh, this is just, you know, just skirting. This is, a, by the way, a great source of information on Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver and the whole mythos, if you will, is uh, Richard Toronto. He wrote a, a great book called uh, War Over Lemuria and has written several other books uh, about – he wrote one called uh, – let's see, Shaver uh, – no, I can't think of it. It's called a Shaver Mystery Home Companion, the stuff you couldn't fit in that book. And then he also, for about 10 years, he, he did a, a, a fanzine on Shaver called Shavertron. And it, it, was, it became kind of a uh, almost like a Fortean publication. It would publish all kinds of uh, you know strange events, but also uh, Shaver was alive at the time. Richard Toronto met Shaver and, and spoke to him at some length. And uh, – uh, so anyway, it's a great source of, of information from uh, Richard Toronto. Uh, but to bring to kind of bring uh, Ray Palmer up to where we need him, he uh, he creates the first uh, science fiction fanzine called The Comet. He uh, he makes friends with a lot of science fiction writers. By the way, when he uh, 
after he came out of a uh, a long hospital period, he bought the first issue of Amazing Stories, and it just absolutely wow. electrified him. And uh, this is a kid that was uh, strapped down for for days, but he would, would read hundreds of books, so he was self taught, and mm -hmm. uh, and he. Uh, Eventually, his uh, edit editing skills became uh, very good, and so uh, he was he was given uh, a uh, an opportunity to edit Amazing Stories. But by this time, Amazing Stories was only selling about nineteen thousand copies a month, which was about cancellation time. But within a, a few months, he turned it around uh, and just multiplied it. And by the first year, it was something like one hundred and eighty-five thousand copies a month. Wow. And it was just phenomenal. So, uh, and he kind of kind of changed it. It was kind of into the, uh, you know, Star Wars kind of thing, space opera, that sort of thing. Uh, and a lot of famous authors got their start back then. But um, so he, anyway, he, uh, he he proved himself very valuable. But then we have to pick up with sh with uh, Shaver. Uh, Shaver uh, was uh, he uh, he ch uh, hopped a freighter to. Uh, Nova Scotia, and it was night, and it was uh, dark, and it was wet, and he uh, he was going to drop into this hold, which he uh, assumed was only about 10 feet down, but it was more like 50 feet, so he was injured, <laughs> he was captured, they, uh, they eventually shipped him back. Now, he ended up this time in Ionia Mental Institution, and people that would go in there don't come out, so uh, uh, he he finally did come out. They think it's because his uh, when his father died, it would have left his mom uh, without any kind of support. So and of course the family wasn't that crazy about uh, somebody that had been in a mental mental institution for several years uh, coming out again. Hmm. But that's that's when he surfaces again in the early 40s and he gets married and is living in Pennsylvania, and he's he's uh, he's coping. Uh, so here's here's where all this comes together. And then we can get off on into the into the really weird stuff. Um, he uh, he writes he sends to uh, Rich uh, to Ray Palmer, and this is, I've got it right here. It's the uh, uh, January issue of Amazing Stories, and uh, these these had these had these great covers, great artists, and so forth. January mm -hmm. 1944. He sends this letter. Uh, call it says an ancient alphabet. So he's he he uh, it's got this this crazy alphabet here, and uh, he says it's the alphabet that all other alphabets come from, which doesn't make any sense. But he's also he's got a, a letter with it. Now it's it's Howard Brown, that's another editor at Amazing Stories, and Howard Brown and and uh, Ray Palmer did not get along very well. Mm -hmm. So and how Howard Brown is on uh, fan letter duty at this time. So he reads this, and this shaver guy uh, says that uh, he wants to warn people about this race, this this degenerate race that lives beneath the earth, and that uh, man we mankind must be warned about this. It's it's because they're in dire peril, right? So he laughs, he wads it up the paper and throws it in the basket. Mm -hmm. Ray Palmer, <laughs> it maybe I don't know if Ray, Ray Ray was a great showman, and he you know I don't know if he saw something. Uh, valuable in it to sell copies of magazines, or if he just wanted to get uh, Howard Brown's goat. But he fished it out and published this alphabet. Well, people responded to it. And then Shaver was encouraged because this was published. And then he wrote a 10,000 page letter to oh. Ray Palmer. <laughs> yes, about uh, outlining his mythos, which we'll get into very shortly. Uh, and so Ray Palmer took that and uh, uh, and multiplied it by about three times and called it I remember Lemuria, and so he you know said this is a, a, a true events but uh, we have fictionalized it and so forth. Okay, so here's here's kind of the basic Shaver mythos: yeah. uh, the Atlans and the Titans. They were a, a star race from off world. They were on Earth thousands of years ago. It was a paradise. Uh, very, very far advanced, and uh, they something happened to the sun. The radiations of the sun changed, where it started to affect their lifespan, which was, you know, was uh, almost almost lasted forever. So many of them take off in ships, but they can't all do that. So some of them retreat underground. It sounds like the Morlocks out of the H.G. Wells novel. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, in elements of other things as well, but yes, certainly. 
So they use uh, existing caves and also with their technology, uh, blast out more uh, caverns and so forth. And they have this, this highly advanced technology, these mechanisms underneath the earth. And uh, Shaver says that there are the thin people are the tarot. Now, the tarot are the good guys. Uh, Darrow means detrimental robot, but not literally a robot. They're degenerate. And what happens is the uh, <laughs> this is crazy stuff. The the machines, the devices that can send rays out on the surface and uh, they can be beneficial. They can be negative. They can they can cause planes to crash. They can cause you all kinds of ills. Uh, uh, the, the, these, this machinery gave off some kind of radiation and affected some of them to the point where they became kind of mutants. And the the uh, the Darrow, when you see the illustrations of them, they look a little bit like a, uh, oh, I don't know, a, a slightly better fit job of the hut with kind of a <laughs> trunk like nose. All right. But not a, not a very great complexion because they're 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 deep underground. Now, there's also there's the small people. There's the giants. They're the, the norms, he calls them, but they're, they're not necessarily good people. Uh, the tarot, the good people, are the thin people. So he's got, we can't cover all of it, but he's got this vast mythology uh, or, or whatever, or, or history, if you prefer, of all this stuff that went on. And a lot of it is fairly consistent, but not always. Every once in a while, uh, Shaver has these deviant claims, uh, but that's that's the that's what's going on. This this degenerate race is hell bent on causing us all kinds of problems. Uh, John Keel uh, read the Shaver mystery stuff when he was a kid, and I think it freaked him out. Yeah, so he was and actually what was really cool is Richard Toronto scored a uh, an interview with him in one of the later issues of Shavertron, and so Keel is, is talks about that stuff, and he called he called the Shaver stuff simply a modern day devil theory. I mean, it's no different than, you know, many of the other mythologies or whatever, where you've got the, the good guys, the bad guys, the, the good influences and the negative influences. Um, so uh, so anyway, that's where the two come together. And, of course, Shaver writes many other stories. And a lot of the uh, the uh, the fans of Amazing Stories are clamoring for more cave stories. Mm. Uh, but a lot of them don't want this crap in there at all they want their pure <laughs> science fiction stuff back so that goes on for a few years eventually shaver has to leave i mean uh well both of them uh ray palmer and shaver stories have to leave amazing stories because the uh uh the the, the editorial policy changed but wow. that's that's sort of uh how it starts but then there are so many ways we can where one of the things we're going to have to talk about are uh <clears throat> The crazy letters. Now, see, people responded to this like crazy. They talk about, uh, you know, experiences they had, even hearing, you know, things in their basement or <clears throat> if they, they knew about a cave somewhere uh, south of Philadelphia, perhaps, that uh, there were, you know, strange voices or, or something coming from. So the, the people responded to this like crazy. And supposedly, Ray Palmer said he had several people that would write to him that this not publicized that <clears throat> would confirm a lot of these claims of shaver through the the voices and the caverns and so forth um any questions so far <laughs> um not so much questions observations really i mean the, the whole yes. notion of underground life that's coming up is obviously not new at all but um right certainly his it's one of those interesting things where they've sort of had lots of experiences being in sort of mental institutions. That you could say, well, obviously he's completely crackers and bonkers, or he's some kind of inspired genius. And because you can't recognise the inspired genius nature of what he's saying, people think of him as being mad, you know, sort of the, the, the crazy genius. But I suspect he may have just been crazy, but it's certainly yeah. fascinating <laughs> so far. I'm keeping up with you, but there's an awful lot of it going on there, certainly. But well, yeah, it, fascinating. It, it, as we get into it now, uh, Richard Toronto kind of compares him a little bit to uh, people like uh, William Blake, uh, Emmanuel mm -hmm. Swedenborg that had he heard yeah. voices. See, Shaver would uh, go into kind of a trance and I mean, Shaver absolutely believed this stuff. Now, there was a he claimed that he was held prisoner in the caverns 
for years at one mm -hmm. point. Uh, Ray Palmer later on found out that, in fact, he had spent some time in mental institutions. So there was a there was a, and also it did seem that Ray Palmer did believe Shaver. He wasn't just a, a carnival, a, you know, a, a carnival barker. He mm -hmm. uh, uh, he he. Uh, uh, people that knew him, other science fiction writers said that, yes, Ray Palmer did seem to really believe that there was an aspect of this that was true. But Palmer believed it was more on the astral plane, that it wasn't necessarily physical. Shaver mm -hmm. rebelled against that and said, oh, no, this is all very physical. This isn't this isn't uh, anything ethereal or on the astral plane. So okay. uh, and even at one point, they actually moved. They they lived next to each other in Wisconsin. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. Uh, but, uh, let's, uh, I have to tell you about some of the, uh, uh, some of the letters that they started to get, uh, there was, uh, well, they had, uh, they had people that would write in and say, well, I remember Lemuria too. You know, they have the same memories and so forth. Uh, uh -huh. there was uh, somebody, uh, that wrote in and said, uh, uh, well, there's, we, there's this cavern South of Pittsburgh. It's at the, uh, at the, at the foot of the Allegheny Mountains, and they 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 went to this caverns to a certain uh, point, and they got to a point where there's this perfect six foot round like borehole in it, which goes into some vast space, implying that there's you know something uh, underneath. So there was a lot of letters like that, but there were also letters like this, a uh, a Bruce and Leslie Hutchinson of West Los Angeles. Now these are all in the mid uh, 40s. Uh, they had a turtle that died. And once the turtle died, it started sending out telepathic messages. And the messages that they received, these uh, <laughs> these brothers from the turtle, confirmed elements of the Shaver mystery. Well, oh. end of story, Andy. I mean, that's it. That that, <laughs> And uh, nobody, nobody asked why the turtle didn't say much when it was still alive. But that's – and then, of course, there were plenty of hoax letters. Uh, this one guy said, well, heck, I have been uh, dealing with the Darrow since 1935, and uh, I'm a graduate of Miskatonic University. Ah. And uh, if you just if you go there and take out the Necromonicon, it'll tell you all about the Darrow. And of course, by that point, uh, <laughs> Mr. Palmer had not read H.P. Lovecraft and Weird Tales. So there you go. Oh, yes. But, the clues that are there really aren't they? Miskatonic University and Necromonicon? Mm. But now there are some other ones. There was this a letter that came in. And originally, it was anonymous. Uh, uh, in June 1946, Amazing Stories. This guy claimed that he and his uh, buddy were shot down during World War II in Burma, back when Burma was called Burma. Uh, I forget. I don't know what it's called now. But uh, uh, okay. And they uh, they were in a cavern. And they were attacked by creatures, and the implication is that they were attacked by Darrow. And they, uh, he had scars on his arm, and his friend had a some kind of a a I don't know, it didn't say, I don't think he said laser, but some kind of a ray or whatever. He has a a, a hole in his bicep the size of a dime, and they they fought these things off with machine guns. And he writes, "For heaven's sake, Mr. Palmer, drop the whole thing." And, of course, he blamed on the Shaver mystery. So, of course, this electrified a lot of people. Well, later on, this guy writes a follow-up letter because he's he's miffed that people think it's a hoax letter. It's Fred Chrisman that wrote the letter. Fred right. Chrisman of of Maury Island. We'll get into that in a, in a moment. Maury Island fame of of Kennedy fame. Jim Garrison called him uh, in the his inquiry. About they thought perhaps that Fred Christman was one of the tramps on the grassy knoll. Right. So, so this guy's writing these cra crackpot letters about Darrow to uh, Ray Palmer in Amazing Stories. And uh, maybe, maybe now we should uh, just kind of give a brief uh, uh, summary of what uh, the uh, Maury Island incident was, because it's just amazing mm -hmm. the way all these things uh, connect. But first. I want to say that you are listening to the High Strangeness Factor, copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Uh, tonight, Andy Mercer and I are talking about the Shaver mystery and trying to keep a straight face. Okay. <laughs> <Very true. laughs> so uh, uh, what, now this this ties in now. Uh, oh, another thing. Uh, Richard Shaver had been talking about uh, 
craft that flew in the sky, didn't use the term flying saucers or whatever, might have called them disks, I don't know. But this is before Kenneth Arnold, um, major sighting in 1947. Of course, no. Kenneth Arnold saw the disks over Washington State and the term flying saucer as was forever coined. And uh, but uh, so when this when when uh, 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 Kenneth Arnold gave his uh, report of his sighting, uh, Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver said, see, this is proof now of the Shaver mystery because we've been talking about these things for some time. OK, so Ray Palmer got got a hold of Kenneth Arnold and wrote about his his story. There's a book called The Coming of the Saucers, where. He talks a lot about, uh, you know, Kenneth Arnold's first sighting, but also Kenneth Arnold gets connected to the Maury Island incident because uh, Ray Palmer sends him out to Washington State to investigate. Now, the way Ray Palmer finds out about this this sighting, which I'll describe in a minute, is from Fred Chrisman. Fred Chrisman talks about these uh said he and uh, Harold Dahl were uh, two patrolmen, uh, boat uh, uh, boat patrolmen on Puget Sound. And but it turns out it looks like they were more was, they weren't in any kind of official official capacity. They were out there. It was near a lumber mill and they would uh, they would find a lot of the, the people would go out and find logs that were just floating uh-huh. in, you know, in the uh, ocean and they would. Uh, collect them and, and sell them or whatever. So that's what it seemed was really going on. But he claimed that this man, Harold Dahl, uh, in Puget Sound one day, looked up and saw five donut-shaped craft. Uh, one of them were uh, had seemed to have some kind of trouble and dropped some kind of slag. Supposedly, it damaged his boat, uh, hurt his son, and killed his dog. All right? This mm-hmm. supposedly happened uh, a short time before Kenneth Arnold sighting. What I believe is that uh, they concocted this after Kenneth Arnold sighting, but backdated it a few days to make it sound like it was something that happened beforehand. Right. But, right yeah. but it's crazy. It's one of these things that's a precursor to to so much in the UFO lexicon, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, they uh, so. Uh, Richard, rather, uh, Kenneth Arnold is convinced to go out there. Uh, 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 Ray Palmer gives him some, uh, wires him some spending money. And so he goes out there. He finds out that a room is already set for him out there in, in Washington State. And uh, the uh, he g- gets in contact with this Harold Dahl, who's supposed to be the uh, the witness to all this. He's, Dahl seems to be very reluctant, uh, but Dahl feeds him the story about this guy dressed in black that uh, you know contacted him the day before. Uh, you know, sort of a precursor to the Men in Black stuff. But uh, and then also Kenneth Arnold finds out there's a, a newspaper, a local newspaper reporter that calls him and says, you know, we're, we're hearing everything that's going on in your uh, hotel room. So he finds out his hotel room is bugged. Finally, he meets he get meets with Harold Dahl and Fred Chrisman and Fred Chrisman takes him to this house where his secretary is. And uh, <laughs> so the, the, he uh, does some investigation. He finds this slag that's supposed to have fallen from one of these UFOs. It looks like just normal slag from a, hmm. uh, you know, from a, a, a I can't some, from one of those plants that produces metal and, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, so, uh, but Arnold is kind of doubting some of this, but he thinks, well, maybe some of this is is uh, is valid. He's got a friend, uh, Captain Smith, in the Air Force. Now, there, there's a couple other other men, and uh, uh, I don't remember their names right now. Two Air Force officers that uh, uh, that uh, he had talked to concerning his original sighting. And they told him, look, if anything else comes up, uh, just contact us. And so uh, these two Air Force officers, uh, he did contact them and get a hold of them. But in the meantime, he uh, goes to this boat that's supposed to uh, have been the boat that was damaged. They can't really see the damage. It's an old boat that doesn't run. Uh, he never never meets Herodal's son to see his injuries or any of that. Uh, so they have to take another boat out to this area, and they go to a part on the beach, and they find some of the slag or whatever, but nothing is very convincing. 
But still, these two Air Force officers get involved anyway, and they look like they're dubious as well. Uh, <laughs> but then tragedy struck because they take some of the slag with them, even though you can tell that they, they think this is a, a, a hoax. And Kenneth Arnold's getting to the point where he doesn't know what's going on, but, but this doesn't pass the smell test. Their plane crashes. They take off. They're going back to their base. The plane develops difficulty. A wing breaks off, and they crash. So these two guys die uh, when they didn't have to, all because mm. it looks like Crispin contacted the, con con concocted this whole thing. Uh, they, they, it's, it's classic Twilight Zone. Kenneth Arnold goes back to the house that uh, – where uh, his secretary was, and the house is empty. There's nobody there. <laughs> and so the the sort of the postscript on this, and you know, and 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 Palmer's got egg on his face. Palmer mm -hmm. had to know that Crispin wasn't credible, even though you know he maybe he just smelled a good story and followed up on it. Uh, Kenneth Arnold feels terrible that he got involved in this, and uh, so. Uh, there was a was a reporter, uh, uh, Jerome Clark, in one of his books, uh, talks about a reporter that uh, went and talked to Harold Dahl. Again, Dahl was the guy working with Chrisman that uh, claimed that he was on the boat when these things flew overhead. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to him on the back porch. And this sort of uh, 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 tells you what's going on. Harold Dahl's wife blasts out the back door with a butcher knife. The reporter Oops. thinks... <laughs> Oh, boy, my my goose is cooked now. And she goes up to her husband and grabs him by his collar and says, stop embarrassing me with your lies. <laughs> <laughs> so Harold Dahl admitted that Fred Crispin cooked up this whole thing. He rented the house. I mean, this had to cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. What what for? What? Uh, Chrisman uh, always seemed to want to be in the limelight. And I'm not sure. I don't know the Kennedy uh, aspect that well. I don't know how he got pulled into that. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure that Harold Dahl did anything nefarious other than create hoaxes and, you know, try and be in the limelight somehow. So yeah. uh, and, and the tr my, my problem is that a lot of people uh, think that the, uh, the Maury Island incident is real. And I, I don't. I think it's a, a hoax from the word go. So it's just that there are so many uh, ways that this thing shoots off in different directions. Uh, let me but here's here's one. I, I love this one. There was a, a guy named Ed John. He lived in, a, in an old Victorian house north of San Francisco. It, right. It's just May 1946. He writes Ray Palmer in, in Amazing Stories. And he says, hey, there's a cave near my house that leads to the underworld okay and he says he, he hears strange noises outside at night and 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 sometimes you can see the knob turning on his his door outside but he says now remember this is 1940s so yeah. it's almost like somebody wrote the script of uh what was to come in in a lot of ufo lore he says mm -hmm. he would see black automobiles drive down his road is this dead-end road and disappear yeah. and he yeah. said they were driving along fairly quickly, and this road is really rough, and if you were to drive even 25 miles an hour, you're going to mess up your suspension. So, uh, and then there was the, uh, uh, the CHMBS. They were the Cave Hunters Mutual Benefit Society, <laughs> and they would uh, – uh, they wrote several times. They investigated a lot of caves because they were really kind of caught up in the Shaver mystery stuff. Well, they went out there to uh, – to uh, check out Ed John's area. And this one guy said that he, uh, uh, he would, uh, he heard voices out of thin air talking in another language, almost sounds like the Skinwalker Ranch. He says his car would stall occasionally and then start again. Classic, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. You know just, just classic stuff. And then one of the, somebody wrote, uh, his uh, John uh, Preve wrote uh, uh, amazing stories and said he contacted Ed John and then John told him that he and two other men went out to the cave in the area. They blacked out. They lost time for two hours and they also allegedly got a photograph of some kind of shadowy being. So even if this is even if this is pure nonsense, you get time loss, you get uh, voices out of out of thin air and you get your car stalling. It's almost like they 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 
uh, got the the basic uh, uh, primer on uh, what a UFO experience should be like. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then it gets, believe it or not, it gets crazier because this guy claimed that he had created a radio that would uh, – you could talk to, uh, you know, there were several radios, like even Shaver had a, a dream one time of this schematic for a radio that you could contact the underworld people and the space people. I don't know if you're familiar with Frank Sumption, you know, Frank's box that they. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Well, Frank Sumption got his schematics from a dream also. And originally it was supposed to contact the space people. So oh. Shaver had one of these. Frank Sumption did. And this uh, Ed fell. I don't know if he got his from a dream, but he claimed things like you had to be very careful because if you heard a heartbeat on this, you should disengage immediately because what it would do is resonate with your own heartbeat and slow it down and you would die. So <laughs> you had this. This is just great stuff. I mean, I, I love this. So uh, but now. Uh, I, I should go back here because uh, Ray Palmer, after he started publishing uh, Richard Shaver's stuff, he actually took – this is back when Shaver was still li was living in Pennsylvania. So he took the, the train from Chicago to Pennsylvania, and he spent the night with the Shavers, he, uh, Shaver and his wife Dorothy. And they talked late into the night, and then uh, they, he went to bed, and his, his bedroom was adjoining uh, another – the shaver's bedroom it's one of these you have to walk through so he's laying in bed you know with his head full of this stuff wondering you know the shaver seems like a normal guy he doesn't seem like a crackpot even though he's writing this crazy stuff and then palmer says he hears this conversation out of thin air about four or five people uh one's a woman's voice one voice is is young like a child yeah. and they're talking about this horrible thing that has has happened about this this woman that was murdered and uh, it happened four miles away and four miles beneath the earth. So Ray Palmer responds to this strange conversation. He says, what is this? What's what's going on here? And the young voice supposedly says, don't listen to him. He's an idiot. <laughs> so Palmer claims the next day <clears throat> he goes and he checks for wires and speakers and everything. and can't find anything. Well, years later. Palmer fesses up a little bit and he did hear voices and they didn't come from the speaker, but they were coming from Richard Shaver while he slept, almost as if he was uh, in a trance. And yeah. there were several different voices coming from him. That's now, that's I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious to know what you think about that, because the only place I've, I've heard of that supposedly is the recordings you hear of people that are allegedly possessed by demons and so forth. Yes, it's Come um, here. there are definitely examples of people who are in a, a psychological state rather than being possessed by something supernatural who can basically show different personalities, particularly with what we used to call script personality, multiple personality disorder now called disassociative personality disorder, where they can manifest more than one personality and there'll be a significant difference in their voice. So, so it does sound like it's a different person. It doesn't have to be anything supernatural to make that happen. It can certainly be done. Um, it can be done, obviously, consciously, deliberately trying to create a second voice. Uh, the real test is when you check the frequency of the voice because we... Everyone's voice is at a slightly different ah, frequency, yes. very slightly. And you, whatever voice you try and put on, it's usually within the same range of parameters of your normal speaking voice. So that's often a test. I mean, the range which you go at normally will obviously vary, but you can't go above or below a certain frequency. So you know, no matter how hard, say, you and I tried, for example, we couldn't sound like a young woman. You know, we couldn't really get up there. It just still wouldn't right. be convincing. You know? So right. voices tend to be kind of recognisable, certainly in a extreme psychotic mental state you can manifest a voice that's very different to your own to the to the ear but when measured on a graph on um, visual frequencies it, it's still within the range of what that person would normally be speaking like but yeah it's certainly possible to the untrained ear that it sounds like somebody else's voice in actual fact it's the same person making it and whether it's a, a spiritual possession which i always dubious of or a psychological state which is often more likely right. you can't tell just by what you're listening to but certainly it's very possible definitely well it, it, another uh, incident uh, uh, years later when uh, the, Sha the shavers and palmers were living next to each other uh, uh 
Richard Shaver had, was dozing on their couch during the Christmas holiday. One of uh, Ray Palmer's daughters, I think Linda, uh, heard the voices coming from him. And you know, normally she said, you know, even though he talked about this crazy stuff, Shaver was a, a normal guy. They, they weren't afraid of him or anything like that. But mm -hmm. she heard these voices coming from him, even though she couldn't make them out on the couch. And that just freaked her out. So it was it was something apparently real. And it was, you know, connected to this weird state of mind, this trance he would go into where he would believe all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that was interesting. But let me give you another uh, really strange. Uh, well, a couple things here. Uh, first, I want to give you another a guy, somebody that was obsessed with the Shaver mystery. But then there's somebody in the past that had a similar affliction, if you will, that might explain some of it. But Charles Marco was uh, was just fascinated by the Shaver mystery. And he's in Flint, Michigan. One time, the day before Christmas, 1945, and he's on it's Saginaw Street and Union Street. And I mentioned that because I went there after reading this, well, after one of my Michigan MUFON meetings, I went to Flint to see if I could uh, see exactly where this guy was standing. Well, he's there and all of a sudden he gets this really strange feeling and he looks over and he sees these two people that are they're very heavily disguised or like have these heavy overcoats on and these slouch hats and so forth well he knows telepathically that these two are the tarot <laughs> the good guys and they're on the mm -hmm. surface for whatever reason and they're sending him a telepathic message and the message is for him to be careful of the rays coming from beneath you know to guard yourself from the rays and charles is dumbfounded and he tries to follow them to have a conversation with them and of course they disappear into the crowd mm -hmm. now marco is just you know, he's obsessed with this. And there's another man that comes into this, a George D. Wright, who is a, a UFO investigator. He's published a, some kind of a, a newsletter or whatever. Uh, I think he's from the Flint area, too. He's a spelunker as well. And he is interested in all this. Now, allegedly, George D. Wright has gone into the caves and he has made contact with the tarot. And he just he vanishes. Nobody knows where he is. So somehow. There's this manuscript he gets out of the caves, and it takes years to get to Charles Marco. And the manuscript de details where it witnesses in Blowing Cave in Arkansas. And he details how to find the tarot. You'd have to go miles beneath the surface. I'm not sure that I would want to do that, you know, to, no. to, to try and go miles beneath the surface on the chance of finding these under earth people. But Marco is is bought at hook, line and sinker. He even moves to Arkansas with his wife because this is his life ambition to make this contact and mm -hmm. to find George Wright again and to meet the tarot. Well, uh, he's also got several other people that are, that are going to go with him on this expedition. One of them was Mary Martin, I think her name was. She she also published a kind of a, a fan scene on the Shaver mystery. So and but then uh, fate moves its huge hand. And there's, there's two. I have two different sources on this. One says he was attacked by Yellow Jackets. The other simply says he had a heart attack uh, not too far from this cave area. And uh, I guess both could be true, but it's so he dies. Charles Marco dies. Uh, mm -hmm. And and it's almost like you could imagine that the evil Darrow knew his intentions and were going to do, you know, stop it at any cost and set their rays out to attack him or to cause the heart attack or to cause the bees to attack him. So here so here this this man that's going to uh, make this journey into blowing cave in Arkansas dies. So that's yeah. how that's how crazy this stuff gets. Uh, but I'm not any crazier than me, I guess, going to the spot in Flint, Michigan, looking around to see if I could find any tarot. But I, I was I was not successful. Uh, but but here is something that is really interesting. James Tilly Matthews, he was a Welsh tea merchant. This is in the 1790s. Right. He was the first guy diagnosed uh, as a schizophrenic. And. Uh, it, of course, he wasn't diagnosed till about 100 years later. Back in the 1790s, he was just nuts. You know, he's just, they just mm -hmm. uh, diagnosed it as madness. So he believes that there's this room uh, below the House of Commons in the basement called the it's the heirloom. And he called it it's the heirloom gang. 
and there's these, I guess, baffles and sails and so forth, and somehow they're they're moving around even though there's no air in there, but they are are causing him the same kind of grief that Richard Shaver believes that the Darrow and these rays are causing him. You see, R Richard Shaver believed he would actually give names to, uh, he called this one Darrow that, that uh, was supposedly plaguing him. He named him Max. <laughs> and, and two of the Tarot were, were, were female. One was Nydia and one was Sue. And they were sending beneficial rays out to try and help him. Well, this uh, James Tilly Matthews had the same kind of deal. He uh, he called one of these whatever uh, people uh, operating the heirloom, <clears throat> Bill the King, Jack the schoolmaster. So the the same kind of pattern exists here. He even believed rays were coming out of this room, and he called one of them a kiting ray, like a kite, like in the air yeah. that would yeah. could implant uh, uh, thoughts in his head that he couldn't get rid of for a long time. So it, it's like just very similar to Shaver, only his caves were a were in the basement in the House of Commons, but they, everything else is the same. You know, you had your your good guys and your bad guys and the rays and so forth. So I just thought that was really interesting. And there's a great book uh, called The Heirloom Gang. And it shows the illustrations of what he believed the the heirloom looked like. You know, it actually d draws yeah. this device kind of. And then again, that just kind of a throwback to all these uh, uh, st uh, strange devices and machinery that uh, Shaver claimed were in, in, in the earth. And a lot, of, a lot of times his stories would be about people that descended into caves and found this, these kind of devices and so forth and would, uh, you know, make escapes from the Darrow and, and, and so forth. Uh but there, there were just all kinds of uh, stories, and a lot of those have been reprinted, and are uh, are, are pretty uh, pretty crazy. Uh, so that's uh, so. I don't know. I think uh, I've come to believe that uh, Shaver wasn't a hoaxer. I mean, he firmly believed what was mm -hmm. going on. I don't know if I if I should compare him to. I want to look into Emanuel Swedenborg much more. Uh, he. Uh, it's just very interesting that uh, you know, Swedenberg believed that he was in contact with people from Jupiter, you yeah. know, and, uh, you know, I asked uh, Rosemary Allen Guiley one time what she thought about that. And she thought perhaps that whatever he was tuned into or picking up, that perhaps that was the way that he could process it as entities from Jupiter, when in fact it might have been something else. But uh, but that that's interesting that you uh, that you said that people can produce those uh those voices that, mm. uh, that that's that's a known phenomenon. I didn't know if that was the case or not. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think drop a pen for a second. an example that comes to mind as you're talking about it is the Enfield poltergeist, where the two girls were a, a seemingly attacked by a poltergeist, a, a, a ghostly figure, certainly. And at one point, one of the girls whose name must have slipped my mind, she definitely later in life shows very real signs of psychological trauma. She has a lot of difficulty. But at one point, she is producing a very different voice to her own. Now, whether it was because she was possessed by a spirit or it was because she was either deliberately faking it or it was part of the psychosis that was definitely um, present in her later in life. We don't know. But it, it's a good recorded example of a, someone putting on what sounds like a very different voice. On the surface, it sounds like it's the voice of an old man. But you listen closely, you can hear it's a child trying to make this voice of an old man. I say on service listening, it sounds quite real. But when you really listen closely, you can tell it is a girl's voice trying to sound like an old man. So that's a good example that came to mind when we were talking about that. Uh, that that is interesting. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, I suspect Shaver was. Oh, let, let me give you one other thing here. They were on when they were living uh, near each other in Wisconsin. Uh, they were on together on Long John Neville's radio show. And, of course, Long John Neville was uh, uh, out of WOR in New York City back in the 50s and 60s, sort of a uh, early version of Art Bell. And uh, he uh, he would have from like midnight to five in the morning, he'd have I, I wish more of those were available. But they would talk about things like the Shaver mystery and they had contactees on. He had. Uh, Andy Sinatra on the Mystic Barber, the guy that claimed he was in contact with Martians and he would wear these aluminum foil contraptions and make <laughs> ray guns out of lampshades. It's just great stuff. And uh, 
So, but here one time through, uh, now the, the technology was, of course, different back then. They had uh, uh, through radio phone, and I don't know exactly how that works, except that when the interview was going on, you would hear a beep every once in a while. So he was talking to both Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver about the uh, the Shaver mystery. And at one point, uh, Long John Nebel says to Shaver, well, how did you escape from the caverns? And Richard Shaver says it was a mistake. But then Nebel didn't pursue it. So what does that mean? The uh, this Darrow stamped the wrong paperwork and he got out early or, or something? I don't I don't know. But they said uh, crazy stuff like the uh, there were high rise buildings in uh, in major cities like Chicago and New York. And be careful, because if you hit the basement button twice, the elevator can go all the way down into oh. the caverns. And that would be bad. <laughs> not not no. a good thing. So it was it was really interesting. They got off on uh, George Adamski and uh, Palmer talked about how uh, George Adamski's first manu uh, manuscript he sent him was mm -hmm. kind of a like a rough draft of what became his first uh claim with uh Dem Desmond Leslie about right. meeting Orthon in the desert in California and mm -hmm. it, it, the original version it was Jesus lands in the desert in California in a spaceship and talks to a man well that Jesus becomes Orthon and then uh the rocket ship becomes a Venusian scout ship so that's right. something that was never published but it's that's it so anyway it's a very you can find that online it's it's really interesting but uh I, I think I suspect, and I don't know what you think, uh, that that Shaver was really tuned in to something maybe similar to the way Chandlers are. Now, not all Chandlers are created equal. I don't think. I think some mm -hmm. may come from a much higher vibration. Some are is just gibberish, and some are hoaxes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think that he was tapped into a source of information. It doesn't mean that the information was objectively real or mm -hmm. or worth pursuing. But uh, like I say, a lot of it had a, a certain consistency. So, you know, it, it, he wasn't just a merely a schiz. Well, a, 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 your, your classic schizophrenic. It seemed like a lot more was going on there. Yes. I mean. I think my question to you would be, what do you think personally? Do you think it's all nonsense or how much of it do you think could be real? Or Well, it's like you mentioned about the, the underworld. There's something uh, that, that uh, everybody sort of taps into. I think that's why it was, there was so, so, so great a uh, response to this in amazing stories is there's that sort of ingrained uh, fear or mythology or whatever of what lies beneath and it yes. might be might be symbolic i mean let's face it all the heroes odysseus uh aeneas they had to make that journey to hades or the underworld and in a way shaver did when he was spent all those years in the institutions yeah i mean it, it resonates with for me because as you've heard me say before i'm actually fascinated by dante's inferno which of course is about going underground and meeting all the the people in the various levels of hell that are beneath the earth so that doesn't present a pretty pleasant picture of a subterranean life either so it, there is something there that resonates the idea i think it goes back almost to what sort of primordial times this whole idea of fearing caves you know what's in the back of a cave the idea of quote cavemen living in the front of the cave that was open to the elements and could get out easily but they're always left wondering you know what is in the depths of this cave is there anything else living deep like a cave or other possible creatures and i mean there are some that would argue that that psychologically speaking that's why we have an almost inbuilt fear of the dark that we aren't entirely comfortable with the dark because of a history of experiencing possible dangers of things that could emerge from a cave so that can play a part in that also i mean we are predators so we are visually orientated anyway that's our main primary sense is our sense of sight so the idea of being in any environment where your primary sense is weakened or removed because it's too dark to see is going to instill a sense of fear anyway so the idea of something living deep underground it, you know, the, the idea that we'd be afraid of that or that, that it would resonate and cause a fear, it's understandable. I think it's something that's woven into our psyche, if you like. It, it may be sort of the core of what sort of manifested in his delusion is that, mm. uh, you know, that uh, that thing we all uh, – carry with us a race memory i don't know from mm. from the days of living in caves or whatever so i i don't think he was i guess i don't don't uh 
uh, write him off as completely nuts, but certainly his much of his stuff was delusional and did not mm. square with reality. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. All right. The final but, analysis, yes. <laughs> but but look how how fa- you know how this all you know we we just scratched the surface. I, I just love the way these things uh, connect and uh, uh, you know uh, the the Maury Island incident and the and the the hoaxes and the uh, the the stories that reflect uh, things that maybe really do happen. And it's so hard to separate uh, what's real and what might be have some substance and what's not. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, Shaver died, I think, in about 75. They had uh, Shaver and Palmer had uh, worked together for a long time, but eventually Shaver moved down to uh, Arkansas in a small cabin. He the, the last thing I'll just mention briefly, he got into what he called rock books. He believed he would cut these the, these rocks in a slice and he would look at the the shapes in there. He believed that these were records of the past and he would he would paint these things and the his paintings are fascinating. I you know even though he's probably not seeing anything in there at all. Uh, it, it's just that, that was the, the whole last part of his life. He was fascinated by this and would scrape together his money to try to find some kind of medium to paint on and paint these what he thought were uh, pre-deluge uh, histories of what had happened. And uh, he he was having a heart. That was his that was his obsession. And uh, but uh, when he died, uh, they, he and Palmer had become uh, kind of estranged for a while. Uh, I don't think Shaver thought he got a, a good shake from all the uh, some of the sales of his stories and so forth. But uh, Ray Palmer said it was like losing a brother when he died. And Ray Palmer died a couple of years later. Ray Palmer, of course, was forced out of Amazing Stories. and But he started his own publishing company. And it, a lot of fascinating stuff. He, he was instrumental in starting Fate magazine, for one. But he also published uh, Flying Saucers and Search and Forum. And I, love, I used to love getting those magazines when I was a kid. And I have at least some collection of those now. So... Uh, but, you know, I, I look at Ray Palmer as uh, as someone that uh, overcame incredible adversity. He married a great lady named uh, Marjorie, had three children and built this small publishing empire. Uh, Richard Shaver, for whatever he was, was true to his uh, own belief system and uh, you know, stayed the course. Uh, it's too bad that perhaps, you know, that certain, maybe perhaps certain medications could have helped this guy and could mm-hmm. have he could have lived a more normal life without hearing these voices all the time yes i mean that would be possibly the saddest part if it all does come down to the fact that he had psychological issues that led to the hearing voices and believe what the voices were saying but you know it's i don't know is it possible that it was something genuine there's real communication there it's a difficult one because you can always say that all of these people that hear these kind of voices are all psychologically disturbed but we all hear voices all of us right know? it's normal you hear your own internal dialogue it's perfectly normal in fact if you don't have internal dialogue <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> if you don't have internal dialogue it's a sign there is something actually quite seriously wrong with you <laughs> so well you know, was, was, was sweetberg that. crazy or did he really tap into something uh yeah. even even philip k dick the science fiction author had some kind of a uh I, I forget what he called it but he had the same kind of belief or delusion or whatever you want to call it uh joan of arc heard voices and it inspired her to do what she did so uh mm-hmm. I, I guess i'm a little hesitant to uh to just completely write it off as as total craziness but on the other hand you look at uh, james tilly matthews and it seems like his delusion didn't have anything to it at all i'm pretty sure there wasn't an heirloom gang in the basement of the house of commons in the 1790s i think there's a fairly good chance there wasn't yes <laughs> <laughs> i think so too although wouldn't it be funny if there was uh oh, the, the yeah. last thing i wanted to cover was uh his his he tried to contact his daughter a few times but never was able to but evelyn evelyn bryant is her, her name uh in later years, she uh, finally did a search for her father. She led her to Marjorie Palmer, Ray Palmer's wife. Ray was dead by this time, and the publishing company was gone by this time. But she invited her, invited her in. Uh, she, uh, Evelyn got some of the writings and some of the artwork of her father, and even got to see her father uh, some slides that they showed on the wall of what her father looked like. And it was it was pretty emotional for her because she had been she had been told she had told been told for years that her father was dead uh but here's the crazy thing 
Ray Palmer, or rather Richard Shaver, whatever he was seeing in these rocks, that that's what that that me that's the medium that inspired his artwork. Evelyn Bryant, without knowing anything about him or his artwork or his writings, would use the medium of ink blots, and her 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 her, her paintings look not the same, but eerily similar to what her father did without knowing him at all. And I oh, thought, wow, that is yeah. interesting. So it was nice for her to at least have that closure and uh, to meet uh, Marjorie Palmer and to do that. Yeah. So I think that's about all I have to say. There, there, there's so many, you know, I have maybe, oh, good Lord, three dozen books uh, that, that connect to the Shaver mystery in one way or the other. And, and you can you can expand it when you get into the hollow earth. Uh, Ray, Ray Palmer in the early 60s revisited the uh, Shaver mystery and he did about a 16 uh, book uh, series called The Hidden World, where he oh. reprinted a lot of the stuff and printed new stuff and letters and so forth. And so there is just a, a well, then Timothy Green Beckley has reprinted some of those with extra material. Richard Toronto is a name you should check out. He's uh, he knew Ray, he knew uh, uh, Richard Shaver. And I don't know if he met Ray Palmer or not. I can't remember. But uh, it's stuff to me. This is just absolutely fascinating. And mm -hmm. so I hope I'm really glad you were here, Andy, because uh, otherwise I would have just been rattling on by myself <laughs> and uh, not not sure if I was uh, being clear enough or, uh, you know, uh, again, we just just barely covered the surface of this, but uh, it's it's also fun to get a hold of the old amazing stories. You, you can still get some of those at uh, reasonable prices, and mm. uh, you know you'll find a lot of uh, uh, original uh, I mean authors in there. Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, uh, I think Ray Bradbury had some stuff in some of the uh, at one period of time. Uh, Edmund Hamilton, another writer of that era, but. Uh, just uh, colorful covers, uh, the letters section reflecting the times and the in World War II and so forth, and of course the the cigarette commercials that tell you uh, camels help digestion and restore energy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's incredible, isn't it? That that kind of thing was just perfectly acceptable back in those days. That kind of nonsense. <laughs> it's more, it's a greater fiction than the actual stories, I think. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I appreciate uh, you being here for this show. And I think uh, if you have any uh, close, uh, closing comments, uh, anything you want to add or? Not really. It's just a fascinating story. As I say, it's um, the interwoven nature of all these different um, people and their ideas all connecting together. But as I said before, I think this does resonate with something deeper within us, this whole underground Alienness. I mean, a, a friend of mine is a, a music composer. Um, he's uh, works on the, the title of Ruptured World, his second album, which has got a long, unusual title. But it is basically his stuff tells stories. He, you have him narrating during the music. He's got a voice sounds like Anthony Hopkins, by the way, very much like Anthony Hopkins, even though Anthony Hopkins is Welsh. My friend is actually Scottish. They, they sound similar, but... He talks about one part of the story, the thing called the Kithrahim, which are this ancient race that live beneath the earth. And this guy, the idea is it's an old diary he's found. The guy goes off to Scotland to investigate the cave. and He finds the cave in which they occupied and he hears voices in the depths and is a bit spooked by it and comes out from the cave. So he's telling the story of that. But that again plays on that. His music's fantastic. It's very much what's called dark ambient, but it's got this melancholy feel to it. And Alistair Rennie, his name is, I absolutely love his music. He's, um, we chat quite a lot about music actually because you know i'm a bit of a dark i mean composer myself and my stuff is nothing like as good as his but he uses that same idea that motif of um underground inhabitants that um <clears throat> his explorer is trying to reach so it, it's something that kind of resonates i think at different levels so that makes the story your story itself all fascinating well that that brings to mind uh, one of my favorite soundtracks is by one of my favorite composers bernard herman when he did journey oh. to the center of the earth oh, and yes. he he used certain instruments. Uh, I think he, it was was it uh, woodwinds and like a bass instruments and so forth. I'm I'm horrible at describing instruments, but he he <laughs> chose certain things to to uh, indicate that this was you know you're you're deep beneath the earth and uh, that there's certain uh, kinds of uh, instruments he stayed away from to compose the music. But that is uh, 
the, that uh, soundtrack is just uh, excellent. Uh, mm. The movie's a little bit silly in parts, but the uh, <laughs> the film soundtrack was just superb, and I, yeah. I never tire of listening to it. Well, if our listeners are interested, just mention very briefly, he's a, he's a good friend, so he's worth promoting. The um, album I was talking about is called Archaeoplanetary, and his name is Ruptured World. It's on Cryo Chamber label. If you want to have a listen to something that tells that kind of underground world story, it's well worth checking it out. So Ruptured World, the artist. Archaeoplanetary is the name of the album. It's really good. So. And where can we, you do uh, Dark Ambient yourself, and where do we find yeah. your music? Oh, I'm um, Dark Mysterium is my channel. I mix different tracks together to create hour long sort of continuous mixes of dark ambient music, which I get to use myself when I'm writing. I find it kind of helps in the background. But um, I plan to launch sometime fairly soon a new channel called Infinite Regress, which is my own personal music. The Dark, the dark Mysterium is other people's tracks I mix. My Infinite Regress is me, my own channel, which I intend to launch at some point soon. <laughs> I get round to it because I see the things I'm doing at the moment, but that one it will be up fairly soon. Before my own dark ambient music on and let's not forget to tell people to check out the last episode of the high strangeness factor where you did one of your classic shows on voodoo with oh, yeah. uh, another mr ward mm -hmm. no relation <laughs> well this is great i hope uh if uh I hope people enjoyed this because I think we should uh, do a show like this once in a while, whether, mm -hmm. you know, whether I, you, you're the, the one that does most of the talking like I did this time <laughs> or vice versa. Uh, I think it's a lot of fun. And I, I really enjoyed this because uh, this is, this has always fascinated me ever since I heard that somebody keyed up a welding gun about six miles south of where I was born and heard strange voices from beneath the earth. Yeah, it, 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 um, one of those things you just have to investigate, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, I guess I'm going to, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, Andy, I want to thank you for uh, uh, taking a chance on delving into the <laughs> shaver mystery tonight <laughs> because you didn't know completely what you were getting into, but uh, you, you were, uh, you put it on, put on a brave face. So that's everything worked <laughs> out. Uh, the High Strangeness Factor was created by Steve Ward and Andy Mercer and is copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I want to thank Irene Ellen Block and Mark Johnson, who are, of course, our, our fearless leaders here at the network. I also want to thank Andy Mercer in his capacity as producer of the show and Brian Zeller for the High Strangeness Factor theme. I can also be heard on Mac Maloney's Military X-Files as a correspondent weekly on this and other networks. And I am Steve Ward, your humble host here on The High Strangeness Factor, a displaced yank here on Paranormal UK Radio. Thank you for listening. I will see you all again in a fortnight. Take care.